slide on the set. To vape or not to vape? That is the question. Why is it the question? Find out on Talking with Henrietta, coming up next. Hi, I'm Henrietta. Welcome to the show. You've probably heard of e-cigarettes, but do you really know what they are? According to the National Institute on Drug Abuse, electronic cigarettes, also known as e-cigarettes, e-vaporizer or electronic nicotine delivery systems, are battery-operated devices that people use to inhale an aerosol, which typically contains flavorings and other chemicals. There are currently more than 460 different e-cigarette brands on the market, and their usage is on the rise. And what's disturbing for many is that their usage is on the rise among young people. With those 12 to 17, most at risk for using this new form of smoking. On this show, I'll talk with four guests who are very much involved with this issue. Greg Zaire, who is seated to my far left, is the Senior Advisor of the Alcohol and Other Drug Policy and Programs, also known as AOD. He leads the AOD program at a community collaborative called Redwood City 2020. Lisa Teeler, seated to my immediate left, is the Interim Executive Director of the Bay Area Community Health Advisory Council, which is focused on eliminating health disparities that exist across the generations and in diverse communities. Sharinda Bryant, seated on my immediate right, teaches freshman English at Menlo Atherton High School. Sharinda is an advisor for the school's Black Student Union, and she leads the Tobacco Education and Policy Social Justice Project. Craig Wingate is a public health educator at the Tobacco Prevention Program in the San Mateo County Health. The program conducts community-based tobacco education programs and services for San Mateo County. Well, thank you so much for being here. It's an absolute delight to have the four of you with me. Now, we have heard about e-cigarettes helping people stop smoking. So what's the problem? Well, um, or is there a problem? Well, that is a great question, and I think that in terms of e-cigarettes <laughs> being viewed as a smoking sensation device, um, there are a lot of uh, myths out there that it is actually that, but it hasn't. There, uh, e-cigarettes haven't been submitted to the FDA for approval. Um, like you have your Nicorette gum, you have your other, you have your patches, other. FDA approved smoking sensation uh, devices to help people uh, cut down or quit using tobacco and e-cigarettes has not gone through the rigorous tests of being a smoking sensation device. Um, so it is not that and unfortunately there's a lot of miscommunication and misinformation out in the public. Well do you know it's interesting I've heard people talking on radio stations who say that they were on e-cigarettes, they used them, and they actually helped them stop smoking. Hmm. You haven't heard anything like that. No, actually we've been hearing the opposite, that this is introducing tobacco, particularly to our young people. Uh, I know personally, I visited my niece who was in college, and I had no idea about e-cigarettes or vaping or anything like that. And then when I visited her, I learned all this information about it, um, that the college students were using it. It was kind of like a cool thing, and it was, it was being touted as um, something that you do um, to, uh, to not smoke. 
Oh, interesting. Now, Lisa, you said vaping, and I said vaping at the top of the show. What exactly is vaping? I'll, I'm going to let Craig <laughs> answer that question. <laughs> So vaping is a, it's an actual a verb that's been um, become popular. It uh, describes what a person does when they use an e-cigarette. Uh, so essentially, uh, similar to tobacco or smoking traditional cigarettes, uh, people inhale the smoke. Uh, for vaping or vapes, uh, instead of ha inhaling uh, tobacco, cigarette, combustible smoke, they're inhaling um, aerosol from the vape pens. Um, it's a myth that uh, what's being released from the vaping device, which um, the myth is that it's uh, a water vapor or a vapor because um, uh, how the e-juice is being um, managed by the device. E-juice? Uh, the um, electronic uh, juice that's in the vape pens that contains nicotine and other chemicals, some um, that are, we know that are causing or can cause cancer. <clears throat> so how the uh, e-juice is used and um, vaporized essentially. So is this something that's recognized that the e-juice causes cancer too? Um, the research that has been done on the e-juice um, has found at least 10 uh, cancer causing chemicals um, in those e-juices and that's something that's not um, you know highly publicized um, especially by the people who create the e-juices also um, majority of the e-juices contain nicotine even though uh, they may say that they don't um, and um, we don't know all the other things that are in e-juices they don't say they contain nicotine some the ones that say that they don't contain nicotine uh, tend to actually have traces of nicotine um, and in terms of the level of nicotine that are in the e-juices it varies um, so there's no regulation around e-juices or uh, e-devices e vape pens or e-cigarettes or any type of other devices sure. now i said the four of you are involved in this issue sharinda how are you involved well, basically, I got involved um, through um, the county's health uh, initiative. Um, they were looking to raise awareness or have a group of young people to to start this project and to raise uh, the awareness on their respective campuses. Um, and so um, I got involved um, as a, a coordinator for uh, that cohort of students. And so um, through the Black Student Union, some of the students um, uh, self-selected and um, wanted to be a part of this project because a little did I know that they actually were very passionate about this issue um, because they have seen the effects. They've, they've, they've been seeing what's been going on um, and this turned out to be the perfect um, way for them to speak out on it. Ah, sure. And we have at least one of those students with us in the audience along with uh, another member who works with Sharinda, Shawnees, who's also worked with students. So, um, how did the two of you become involved? And I haven't forgotten you, Greg. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm Shawnee Stevenson, and I'm, I'm the project manager. I work for BACHAC. Um, you have a, a microphone? No. And I, I work. Well, I don't think you have a microphone right now. So we'll get you a microphone, and in the meantime, we'll go to you, Greg. Yes. Your question. How, so how did you become involved? And, and say more about AOD, alcohol, and other drugs policies and programs. Well, AOD is, is just that, alcohol and other drugs, and it focuses not on, only on um, uh, tobacco, vaping, and so on. It focuses on marijuana, opioids and all the things that have um, wreaked havoc on, in a number of communities. Uh, and so that is what initiated my interest. Uh, I am a social justice warrior, I suppose, someone who spent my entire career working on issues that, in fact, in fact um, impact our communities. <clears throat> that can be anything from drugs in our communities, crime, policing, uh, housing, and so on. And so this fell really nicely into my wheelhouse. 
So I had mentioned in introducing you that you're a part of a community collaborative called Redwood City 2020. Yes, ma'am. So tell us about that. What, what well, Redwood City 2020 is a collaborative, and it, what its, initial, its interest is in bringing together uh, a whole host of collaborative partners to deal on, uh, to discuss, talk about, and resolve issues that no one partner can do on its own. And so that's the power of a collaborative organization. And Redwood City, uh, as uh, one of the partners within the collaborative, have uh, taken up AOD as one of its core issues, uh, along with um, uh, success programs and so on. So uh, Lisa, mm -hmm. the Bay Area Community Health Advisory Council. Mm -hmm. What would you like to know? <laughs> How it became involved in this issue? Well, and we've, why? Well, I, one of the things that we've always concerned, the, the organizations focus on health disparities. And um, when the word got out, we've partnered with the San Mateo County Health on a number of initiatives. Um, and when uh, we heard about um, this effort around reducing the use of tobacco among youth um, and the marketing to youth, which is very insidious, um, and also restricting the sales of tobacco, we felt that we definitely needed to be a part of this, um, so part of the solution. Um, and so that's why we uh, partnered with the county and um, hired Shanice um, and others uh, to address this issue because it's really impacting our community, particularly our young people and our youth of color in the community. Um, and we've seen the effects of that um, in our community and as it may lead to other other health issues as we know. Well, I are any of you familiar with what the city of San Francisco has done when mm -hmm. it comes to e-cigarettes? Because some cities are banning yes. uh, the sale mm -hmm. of e-cigarettes. Mm -hmm. And uh, Greg, how familiar are you with with that particular action on the part of San Francisco? Um, yes, well, San Francisco uh, adopted an ordinance a few months ago um, banning the sale of uh, flavored tobacco products, and, um, but they still uh, had e-cigarettes, like the actual devices, uh, in stores. So they're now looking at um, implementing a policy that would uh, restrict the sale of e all e-cigarettes. Um, here in San Mateo County, um, the policymakers that we've worked with and um, our focus has been on uh, restricting the sale of flavored tobacco products. So currently the um, uh, county and unincorporated areas of uh, San Mateo County have a ordinance restricting the sale of flavored tobacco products. Uh, the cities of Half Moon Bay and San Carlos do as well and the, as well as the town of Portola. Now, is all of this because more and more young people have taken up uh, using e-cigarettes? Well, part of it is not only e-cigarettes. Part of it is there's a vaping culture that is pervasive that we haven't really touched on uh, thus far, but we should really talk about that because those are the things that welcome or inveigle, con, cajole individuals into um, participating in e-cigarettes. And we may talk about the over-the-counter stuff, but there's also uh, the opportunity for young people to create their own liquids at home, mm -hmm. which is a different kind of danger altogether. Mm -hmm. In conjunction with that, and the other thing that we may not want to talk about, but it should be put on the table, is that there are certain manufacturers now that are um, advertising about the health benefits, uh, uh, say B vitamins within mm -hmm. um, e-cigarettes. So it's a pretty expansive industry and it's it's taken hold and in a lot of um, schools young people are even vaping during class or behind uh, the bleachers or in the bathrooms um, and so that is uh, as I've heard the other guests talk about a big concern for each one of our either agencies or institutions uh, because young people are at risk their health uh, and livelihoods are at risk. Mm -hmm. Sharinda, Greg just talked about the vaping culture and before I let him say a little bit more about it, are you familiar with this whole idea of vaping culture? 
I became more familiar um, through uh, working in this project, and I learned a lot from the students. Um, and so uh, what Greg said is absolutely correct um, as far as students uh, vaping in classrooms, in the bathrooms. In, in, in Menlo Atherton, if there has been an increase of suspensions because of this, or because of having the paraphernalia on campus. Um, and so, you know, now we get into a, a little bit of a different issue when, when suspensions increase. But um, it is a trend, you know, and um, this age group, 14 and 17, is very, you know, they, they want to do what's popular. So um, without even hearing or knowing the, the, the effects, they, they want to do, you know, what everyone else is doing. Sure. Now, um, if it's vapor, how do you vape in a classroom? Wouldn't the vapor spread in the classroom and everybody knows that you, you were vaping? Well, it's because, precisely because it is a vapor. It's not traditional smoke. So you can tuck it into your shirt and blow. And the, the odor is disguised. It smells mm. like anything that they, they want it to smell like, meaning the manufacturers. Like flavors. Watermelon, candy. cotton candy, mm. well, honey when you, bun. When you start <laughs> smelling that, then wouldn't you know that the person, somebody is vaping? Well, not initially, right? It could be teachers might suspect that it's a lotion, mm -hmm. right? Or could suspect that they just came from a bakery. <laughs> <laughs> candy, gum. Candy, right. gum. Mm -hmm. right. um, but now, as our awareness about what the impacts are and what the odors are uh, is increasing, there are chances, as Sharinda talked about, with regard to suspension. And so we, we're stuck in this middle halfway house, so to speak, where we there's a lot of research about the dangers, uh, the awareness of uh, faculty and administrators is not um, at its peak at this point. The saturation with regard to awareness is not necessarily out there. And so the, our response is traditionally suspend. That's our form of corporal punishment or discipline. And there needs to be some kind of understanding about why young people are a part of, are taking part, are partaking mm -hmm. uh, within the culture and, and the impact. Well, I'm going to try and do something. We have a shortage of microphones. And I would like to have the two of you give your input. So I am wondering if you could come around and maybe stand behind Greg. We'll see if this works. <laughs> and yes, and talk about students yes. on campus. So if you could come around the back of the camera and, and we'll just see if this can work with you talking loudly enough maybe to use Greg's microphone. So introduce yourself, and I'll be told if they can hear you. <laughs> yes. Uh, my name is Anaya Majors. I am currently the Sequoia High School Black Student President. And when my teacher, when the advisor told us about this program, it kind of it boosted for me because you know not everybody knows about it, and I see it every day. Like you guys are talking about how the kids are in class, like. Some teachers don't notice. Some teachers are like, they know what's going on, but some teachers don't, because not all of the vape pens have just nicotine. Some kids buy their their jewel pots with marijuana, mm. with the oils. So wow. it, it varies of like which ones mm. they're actually using. So in jewel pots, they have nicotine, but also they have it where it's mixed with not just nicotine, where it's mixed with marijuana, no, you said jewel pods. The company is it's jewel. It's a brand. Uh huh. And so okay. you, you guys are talking about like e juices. They're mostly called like jewel pods. So they're little tiny little pods. Like some you can get them where like it's a, a container. Like it looks like eye drops, where you take that wow. and then you fill it into the little tiny pot, like the little tiny little container that it goes in that you stick into like your little jewel pod and then you just in class. So what do you think about all of that? I personally myself do not use it because I don't think it's good. And I know that there are students that do it all the time. And I have friends that when I'm around, they don't do it because I don't like, I know any type of drug can get you hooked on a numerous of things. And in my life, like that's taken a lot of, out of my family. So I always promote, you know, not smoking and just doing the right thing. But you know, some people don't want to hear that. They want to join the fun and seeing all the young, like 
kids younger than me do it, mm-hmm. it's surprising. And how old are you? I'm 17. Uh huh. And I have a younger sister that's 14, that's turning 14, and a younger brother. And they see and they, they see that, and it's popular, and they want to do it, and it it kind of it worries me because you see all the kids around, mm-hmm. and they're doing it because it's fun, but they're not seeing the health risks in it. Mm-hmm. What's fun about it? Just the app, actual what puffing or mm-hmm. inhaling, it's or the, the flavors. Or? So it's a numerous of things because some kids like it because they can get high, and some people like it because it makes them feel good. The flavors come in numerous, like. There's people who do like raspberry, blueberry. There's like a numerous of things that promote the, promote e-cigarettes, and that's what like gets people because you don't know if it's an e-cigarette or not because they look like little USB cords that you can plug mm-hmm. into your computer. People will charge them on their computers. Really? Like they're mm-hmm. USB. They're like like yeah. this big. You can take one side, plug it in your computer, and then when it's charged, you can use the other mm-hmm. side. Like they're just things. when you say use the other side, use the other side as a USB. But you don't have to charge them to smoke. It, it's just... It depends that, on which one you're using. That's part of the function wow. as a USB. Yeah, uh, so how it works is if you get one that looks like a USB cord that you can, like, plug your... Like, you know, you plug your phone charger into. How it works is if you buy one like that, you take one side and you plug it into the computer to charge the battery on it because the easier is like, a lot of them are electronic. So you just use it to charge the battery and then you can take it off, cover the battery part of, and then use the other side to get smoke out of it. Well, you know, you mentioned the company Juul, and a representative from that company is testifying in front of Congress mm-hmm. this mm-hmm. week. Mm-hmm. And uh, after his testimony, one of the uh, congressional leaders said that he's just plain selling poison hmm. in no uncertain terms. Mm-hmm. Do you agree with that? It seems like it's really big business. Thank you for your input. <laughs> we might call on you again. <laughs> so I'm, I'm hoping that she was heard very clearly. So is it poison? Hmm. Well, I, I believe it is. I mean, whenever you put any kind of chemical in your body and it has traces of nicotine and as uh, uh, Craig just mentioned 10 other chemicals that cause cancer, that is poison. And that can lead to other things. I mean, Sharinda just mentioned uh, suspensions are going up in their school. So there's other implications that are impacting uh, Suspensions it. because pe- the ch- students are vaping. Getting caught with no. either vaping it, or with the device. Do the schools device. have some type of regulations that the vaping isn't allowed? Right, it's under the kind of the general, you know, no, no drug policy on campus, um, and so. And these are considered drugs by the schools. Correct, correct. So um, now. And paraphernalia, so it's, it's yes. drugs and paraphernalia. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The California Code for Suspension is very clear about that. It's not just drugs, so we should be mindful. Mm-hmm. And so, in many situations, school districts' hands are tied by the policies that they have to abide by. Mm-hmm. So those suspensions, what do they look like? Suspension, suspended for how long? Um, depending on the infraction, could be one to five days. Um, usually not five days, one to three days. Um, so you know, then you're you're missing class, and I I just feel, I the the school has made a, a real targeted effort to to crack down on this, and I know. It was probably it's probably been an, uh, an issue for a while, but now they're like we're really going to crack down, um, and they do have some awareness that they're trying to bring um, through posters and and other things um, on the campus. Um, but as uh, Greg said, this is a a culture thing, and so to shift the culture on the campus, we have to do a lot more than hang a sign. That's interesting <laughs> to shift the culture around the campus. Is there more that can be said about the culture? Certainly. Well, I, I just want to talk just a bit about suspensions because there, we're working on policies now, and Sequoia Union High School District has really been proactive about thinking about uh, ways to, to mitigate some of the detrimental effects to young people who are suspended. So we're thinking about in-school suspensions, programs that um, limit how many days a child spends away from school. Now, I have a question. It's, sure. it's 
you know, it's very thoughtful to be concerned about the student who's been suspended, but that student has been, is breaking the school regulations. That student knows that they shouldn't be vaping. Now, is this vaping on the campus itself or vaping in the classroom? I mean, if the student is vaping on the campus, is that worthy of being suspended? My understanding is yes. I'm not sure how it works at um, mm -hmm. So uh, uh, if students anyway. know that they're going to be suspended, why do they continue? Well, we're talking about addiction. We're not mm -hmm. just talking mm -hmm. about a, a, yes. a, a, an activity that they're partaking in. We're talking in a lot of mm -hmm. instances addiction. So, so you're, saying, you're saying that these students are already addicted? Potentially. I don't know which student we're talking about, but there is an addictive mechanism attached to vaping. Mm -hmm. And it's purposely so because of the manufacturers. Mm -hmm. sure. yeah. um, it's, it's supposed to, we started the program talking about how it's supposed to ease an individual off of uh, traditional cigarettes. But that easing, there is a, a gap between uh, abstinence and use that mm -hmm. is not being filled adequately by. Well, I, I have a question in terms of this. If they are marketed for adults to help them stop their smoking habits and they're already addicted? I mean, it's addicting using them. How is that going to stop somebody from smoking? Can I just say that it's questionable whether it's marketed to adults. I don't know if Honey Bun is for well, adults. Well, <laughs> well, the, the, the yeah. person, you know, representatives from Juul say we're doing everything we can. It's not marketed for young people. It's mm -hmm. marketed for adults. Well, I'm certain everyone around us, they will probably disagree when you look at the colors mm -hmm. and the flavors. Yes. It's not adult. Strawberry, watermelon. Yeah, yeah. Like what adult would candy. buy that? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's don't, don't adults like those flavors? <laughs> <laughs> not as much as children. <laughs> no. But to your point, Henrietta, I mean, I've seen the commercials on TV, and they've been more lately where they're advertising it as to adults yes. as a way to get off of smoking cigarettes. But that's just smoke and mirrors, for lack of a better word, because they are actively targeting young people. And also, the research shows that uh, people who make the switch, which is Jules' uh, tagline, um, they tend to use both uh, traditional cigarettes as well as uh, e-cigarettes. Uh -huh. So uh, when they can't smoke traditional cigarettes, they'll switch to e-cigarettes. And when you do, when you look at the like previous marketing, like when they first came out, you, you look how they were on social media and the different type of advertisements and the flavors, over 15 mil, or a thousand flavors, different types of flavors, they are like unicorn poop. What, what adult would use something called unicorn poop? So no. it was very <laughs> targeted to youth. Just to try it out. <laughs> <laughs> I, I definitely would not want to try anything called unicorn poop. <laughs> I mean, I'd, I'd just like to also say that we need to put this also into context when we think about what young people, particularly in that 12 to 17 year, year old, uh, range are doing. They're trying to become or express themselves independent of their parents. Mm -hmm. So a cigarette is an easy device to achieve that. So it may be marketed towards adults explicitly, but young people, teens particularly and adolescents, see it as a gateway to adult. so-called adulthood. Mm -hmm. That's the sociological part of it that is not a part, that's not usually a part of the, the discussion at all. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the biological, the danger of youth using these devices is that their brains are still developing. They, their brains develop until they're early to the mid-20s. And um, their brains are just being transformed into uh, being addicted to nicotine. So tell me, um, is that any different from using cigarettes? I mean, if, if the vaping is harmful to the brain, Mm -hmm. Wasn't cigarettes harmful too? Yes. To the same degree? Yes. And cigarette smoking has gone down. Because of uh, various policies that have been passed throughout the years, because of regulations that the FDA have put in place, uh, we have seen and continue to see a decrease in cigarette smoke and, uh, and usage. Um, and that's a great thing. That's what we want to see. We want to see uh, communities healthy and not addicted to 
any type of tobacco, especially cigarettes. Um, but now that uh, e-cigarettes are in the market, there's a whole new opportunity mm -hmm. to get more people hooked. And research also shows that um, in terms of youth use, they, when they are using e-cigarettes, they're four times more likely to uh, transition into uh, combustible cigarettes. Really? Mm -hmm. Yes. Why is it that e-cigarettes don't give the same level of nicotine or? That may be the case um, in terms of uh, people wanting more of that nicotine. Um, they'll transition into cigarettes to get that amount of nicotine. Can no, no, I think, no, you were the one that said, either you or Greg said that under the culture, people are, young people are making up their own. Yes. They can make up their own. Their own liquids, yes. So if, if students, if somebody can make up their own liquids, aren't they then in control of what type of liquids and the content of the liquids or no, to increase the dose of nicotine in some way? It hmm. goes back to uh, what I said earlier in terms of we don't really know what's in the uh, e-juice. Um, it could be marijuana, it could be some level of nicotine, it could be something significantly higher than what's traditionally in, um, what's marketed as uh, e-juice, as it's like given to the, um, when a person buys it, they could say it has like four milligrams and it actually has 14. Um, so we don't really know um, because again, there's no regulation on these, uh, these products and these de the e-device e itself. So but additionally, the ease of use with an e-cigarette or electronic or a pod Right. It doesn't just have to be a jewel or an electronic cigarette. They have these pods now. And it's that that young people are making um, their juices. Mm -hmm. And so the ease of use with regard to being able to just readily take a hit and then, or not light up a cigarette, but take a hit, uh, often c encourages them to take multiple hits more than they would with one cigarette. Are there any health problems that have shown up yet hmm. with young people? that you know of? Uh, the research shows that there have been st some um, health issues that have come up. Research is still new um, and more research needs to be done. Uh, and that's the point. Uh, why have these products out in, in the community allowing people to use them when they haven't undergone um, heavy research studies, uh, FDA approval? Um, that's that's why should the community and the population as a whole be guinea pigs for <laughs> Juul and other uh, tobacco industry companies? So can a company just put anything on the market like that without, for public consumption, without having it tested and FDA approval? Well, Juul I has. mean, yeah. can, <laughs> can I just create a liquid and, and market, yeah. sell it, and if I can sell it, and well, that's where we are now right. in terms of Joel and uh, other uh, e-cigarettes and e-juice companies. Uh, essentially, they put a product out in the community and people are buying it because of their uh, fake marketing. <laughs> well, I must say one of Joel's major contributors, supporters, happens to be a tobacco company. Hmm. So oh, we true. do know mm -hmm. what the interest is. Shawnees, I don't want to leave you out, and I don't know if you want to come up, <laughs> come up here. and use Greg's microphone <laughs> and, uh, and say something. And you can walk behind the camera, if you would like, behind the camera. And we'll, we'll see how this goes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, you work with students. You've worked with students. So I was the project manager. So I worked. She is the project I, yeah, manager for for the project, for the project, project that's been taking place at yes. Menlo Atherton. Yes, at B A C H A C. So what we were is that we worked with the BSUs um, at Sequoia High Union, the Black High Student School, Unions mm -hmm, at Sequoia High School and Menlo Atherton. So I worked directly with the advisors. And we also work with um, a middle school that was in Pacifica, and I work with their advisor there, and they came up with a social media campaign to really talk to their peers about the dangers of flavored tobacco. The students did. The students did. 
And so how did that work out? I assume it's over now. It's over now. I, I think the, the project was great. I think what the greatest part about it was that the 20 youth that we were working with um, ended up, I think they learned something new, and so they were able to like stand up in class. Like one student talked about that. A middle school student talked about like, hey, is that what's happening to my cousin or my my brother, like, because they're doing it too. Like, they didn't know, like, the impacts on the brain. Um, they didn't understand the impacts on the body. Um, and we did training with them so that they, they're not saying what we want them to say, but they're having an experiential process where they come up with their own words and, and their why. Um, and they did videos, they did all kinds of things, but they also were just very creative, writing poetry and, they wanted to tell others, and um, one of our students really talked about the teasing piece because they were part of the project, but they said because they learned more, they did things differently, mm -hmm. and the things that they were already seeing in the schools and in their community, they now were aware and able to talk about it more. Now, when you talk about the teasing piece, mm -hmm. what are you talking about? Um, it's not popular. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> it's not popular right. to stand up against something that's part of the culture. You, you really have to have a lot of courage as young adults, young people. Um, I know that um, there's sometimes guilt there because maybe they have tried it and didn't like it, but there's shame there. Mm -hmm. And so there mm -hmm. were people who could have been a part yeah. of our project. We didn't assess whether or not they used it, but we were like, hey, you know, you're va just as valuable as a person who never did it or had a health condition or whatever the case may be because that could be kind of like your testimony or your truth that you can share out as we give this message. Sure, stand there for a moment. Yes, Let me just say, <laughs> how long has e-cigarettes e been in the public arena, so to speak? Oh, that's a good question. Um, 2019? Um, They've been around for a while. Uh, they started out as uh, a traditional, they looked like traditional cigarettes. It was like an electronic cigarette that looked like a cigarette. Um, and you didn't really see that much. You saw advertisements for them in magazines. Um, but they didn't take, like, they didn't catch fire until Juul came out um, with their device. Uh, and that's when you started seeing more youth using it. And, and about when was that? Uh, that was probably about two or three years ago. Okay, so talking about youth culture or the culture, how did something that came out or it be started becoming popular two or three years ago reach such a, a peak, so to speak? I think much of it is attached to uh, the things that I talked about just a second ago with regard to identity. It's a status symbol in a lot of, of, mm -hmm. of cultures, right? I mean, it's as um, symbolic as a, uh, I don't know, a gold watch mm -hmm. or something like that, where young people um, are, because of peer pressure, encouraged to, to participate or fall outside of that culture mm -hmm. um, or be ostracized or be thought of as, um, goodness, I'm going to use this term, but not cool. <laughs> sure. Mm -hmm. So, Shawnice, I don't want you just to stay there mm -hmm. if you want to sit down. Yes, thank <laughs> you. <laughs> and you know the other thing I do want to say. But I'd like to invite you up, too, if you'd like to be a part of the discussion. <laughs> is the fact that we're also, and I think I'm just so proud of this, is seeing young people actually speak up and speak in front of city councils and mayors and their peers. So this is the other benefit of this project is not only the, the health issues and having the young people speak to other young people about the dangers of this, but we're also creating an environment where, they, where we're developing the leaders among our young people and they're feeling comfortable about speaking up, you know, um, speaking in, in front of people. We taking know that's action. pretty scary. Yeah. And mm -hmm. taking action and taking that pressure, you know, being teased and being able to sure. utilize the tools that they can to say, you know, that. That's, I'm, I'm okay, and I'm trying to tell you something that's important yeah. about Since your Since we health. don't have you identified on screen, mm -hmm. give your name again. Uh, my name is Anaya Majors. Anaya. 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 So, Anaya, were you teased? No. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the way you say it, it wouldn't yeah. have made a difference anyway. Right. <laughs> Confidence, that's true. Because my friends, like, I, I'm going to tell them like it is, like, 
I don't agree with smoking. M- myself, I used to smoke a lot. Like, oh, did you? Oh, I was around when they had the little big pens that looked like cigarettes. I was in the fifth grade doing it. In and the wow. fifth grade? And I, we, me and my friend. And let's see, how old would you have been in the fifth grade? Let's see, 11, 12. I, I was 11. 11. Wow. Mm-hmm. So this is a little story. Uh, me and, and my friend. And how did you get how did you get them? I'm going to tell you. Me and my friend, <laughs> we went to the store, and the, and the guy was like, we can't sell it to you. So we gave another guy the money that was older than us mm-hmm. to buy it, and he went to go buy it and brought it out the store for us. Wow. And then we just walked on our merry way. Mm-hmm. But after a while, I just didn't like it. So Why? it just wasn't, it wasn't fitting to me anymore. Like, I didn't. I didn't see it as something that I wanted to keep doing. So once six, like once I got into like sixth grade, it just didn't seem appealing to me anymore. Like which I had means you didn't get addicted. No. It, and what it, about your friend? She still smokes and does no. the things that she do. Yes. And but you're seventeen, and she would be about seventeen. Too. Yes. And so she smoked that long. Yes, but she doesn't use nicotine anymore. So she's smoking something else. Yes. <laughs> See, the thing that a lot of people, it, dep- it varies the person, I might say. Like, I myself, nicotine, it's not appealing to me. So once I moved on from it, I didn't look back. For some people, they could smoke cigarettes, and that's all they think about. But then they move on to the nicotine patch, and then it changes, and then they don't want to smoke anymore, and they use different ways to feed into, you guys are saying, the sensation. Mm-hmm. A lot of people just use nicotine once or twice and then don't see an addiction by it and don't use it. Like they say, it takes 20, 21 days to get to create a bad habit or to create a habit in general. That's just how it felt for me. Like I used nicotine for 20, more than 21 days when I was in the fifth grade, but after I seen that I didn't like it, I stopped using it. Now, did your parents know? No. I told my mom when I got into like, high school. <laughs> <laughs> so where did you smoke? Or use it. <laughs> the park. Because, you know, no one notices what you're doing at the park, and you know, it just goes in the air and it's gone. Mm. But you guys are talking about, like, the students and classrooms. Like, I've seen it. It's everywhere. Like, the thing that a lot of students do in class is they'll smoke and they'll hold it in. And that, that causes, like, a whole lot of problems in the body because you're not supposed to keep the air in because it's really bad. Like, you get really sick and things can get stuck and your body doesn't function right. Some people, they blow it into their shirt, and teachers don't notice it. Some teachers know. Some teachers don't. But nowadays, e-cigarettes, they're mainly used for getting high. Mm -hmm. People use them now to get high. Like, they have it mixed with marijuana. So the the marijuana oil they're using in their e-cigarette is how they're walking around class like this (laughs) because they're getting high off of what they're smoking. But teachers don't know that because you can't smell it. So, what do you think, before I ask the others sitting here with me, what do you think should be done? I think it, it, you know, it takes one day, one day at a time, and, you know, it's a process. Me speaking to people about it, you know, they're just like, I don't want to hear it. Like, mm. Them getting in trouble, they, they're still going to be like, okay, well, I'm just going to go home and do it anyway. It's more of just about how they need to see the health risks on their own because you know your parents are going to tell you like you're going to keep getting in trouble if you keep doing the same thing they have to learn when they're going to want to have to stop they're going to have to see something really bad happen but it might be too late i mean they might be addicted by that time and then that's when you know that rock bottom hits in and you figure it out because i know people who have to hit rock bottom before they even want to stop smoking or doing any type of drug well i don't know about rock bottom, but I know the writer Mark Twain said it's easy to stop smoking. He's done it many times. <laughs> 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 so, rock bottom, what, how would you describe rock bottom? Mm. Well, it, it depends on everybody because, you know, some people, they just see like, I have a friend where, you know, she smokes marijuana and nicotine, but after a while, I started to tell her like, because there was health risks involved. And I told her, I was like, if you ease off of the nick and stop using it as much, then you'll start to see that you don't need it all the time because nicotine, you're going to have that in your brain like, oh, I'm not doing nothing, so I'm going to use nicotine. I'm going to smoke some nicotine. Like, 
it's all about the person and how they use it. Because not a lot of people, they use nicotine and don't get addicted. Mm -hmm. Some people use it every day and get addicted. Like, mm -hmm. it depends on, like, who that, like, how they want to stop. Because you can't tell somebody what to do just because, like, it's, right. they're not going to change. Like, if I keep telling someone, yeah, stop smoking every day, that's not going to, it's not going to matter. Because they're going to hear from me every day and still not change. It's just That's just me nagging in their ear. Thank you mm -hmm. so much. I, I appreciate mm -hmm. your input. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm learning something. I learned something today about the marijuana oil. See, that's, that's what I'm saying. It's like it's it just evolving. keeps going on and on. You know, first it's the nicotine, and it's, now we're talking about marijuana. So it just keeps expanding, expanding, which is a scary it's thought. Well, you, right? you, yes. you talked about our future leaders, and a nice seems to really mm -hmm. be one <laughs> who's willing to speak up. Yeah. So proud. you can sit if you'd like, or you can stay. Thank you. <laughs> mm -hmm. I'll go have a seat. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> now, I had asked her what can be done. Mm -hmm. So what can be done? There's cities like San Francisco that's banning it. And we'll see what our Congress, rep congressional representatives do with the testimony that they've been hearing, where one response was, it's just absolutely poison, and that's... It seems unethical, but then selling cigarettes and getting yeah. people addicted seems unethical and immoral. Mm -hmm. So we're back. Mm -hmm. What can be done? Well, um, policymakers like in Patola Valley and San Carlos, Half Moon Bay, and the county of San, uh, San Mateo, um, they can do something to protect their uh, constituents. Mm -hmm. and they can put restrictions on the sale of flavored tobacco. Um, so that's definitely in 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 their areas. In their areas, yes, uh, and um, they can reduce the uh, access to these uh, products, uh, which would uh, potentially reduce uh, usage um, because people wouldn't be able to buy it anymore. Well, one response is that if a city puts restrictions and bans the sale, people will just go outside of the city limits to mm. wherever it is, they can still buy it and buy it. Yes, it's, um, it's like water, it finds a way, doesn't it? Mm. And so I, I, the policy approach about putting limitations or ordinances on uh, e-cigarettes, while productive in a great many ways, it doesn't address the core issue, and some of those core issues involve not e-cigarettes or not any kind of drug per se, but the lack of opportunity for youth development. Mm -hmm. And so those are some of the critical issues that need to be a part so of the conversation. So how do you tie a lack of youth development in with the use of e-cigarettes? Because <clears throat> it's like using cigarettes. Were cigarettes used by young people because of a lack of opportunities? However, the tobacco industry specifically targeted people of color with menthol-flavored cig cigarettes. I mean, they, they've, we've seen the data, and we've seen the actual memos from those companies back in the 50s and 60s. So this is, a, this is also a social justice issue, um, that they are specifically targeting youth of color around this, around this, issue, around this product. And so they're just repeating history again. They're doing exactly the same thing they did what, 50, 60, 70 years ago, well, they're doing the same thing. I, I can remember, too, the ads for Virginia Slims, like, mm -hmm. you've come mm -hmm. a long way, way baby. baby. Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. So women were targeted. Yeah, and Their flowery ads and right. yes, the LGBT exactly. community was targeted. Mm -hmm. um, the tobacco industry hijacking certain symbols like the rainbow and putting it in their mm -hmm. um, product, the advertisement for their product. So. Um, yes, the tobacco industry is very smart and very slippery, um, and it constantly evolves into something else. And currently, it's evolved into e-cigarettes and other um, and other vaping products. And uh, yes, there is the policy angle, and there's also the community education and uh, youth development, and tying all those things together. That's how we're going to combat against the tobacco industry. That's how we're going to save youth and young adults from yeah. these, these poisonous products. So Greg, you first mentioned youth development. What did you have in mind? Well, I, I think that we have divested uh, a great deal from youth 
engaging youth in some activities within their neighborhoods. Our parks are uh, prescriptive. Uh, there are few activities for which uh, they can engage. Uh, youth employment, any host of um, development activities are further and in, in far in between one another. And I think that there's an opportunity for us to look uh, simultaneously at the uh, e-cigarettes. And, and I want to say that it's, again, I don't think that it's just e-cigarettes because, as I said before, like water, osmotic, it'll find a way. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember when I was uh, in college, it was huffing. So it was <laughs> throwing some aerosol in a bag and, and, and inhaling it. So I, I think that there's a lot of opportunities there, but there's not enough education. And I think, as Anaya is uh, so wonderfully exemplified, that there are voices out there that can attach to this issue and, and start to kind of peel back the curtain for a lot of young people that we're not necessarily taking mm -hmm. maximum advantage of. And when you talk about a social justice issue, how can the idea of social justice be something that gets recognition? Well, I think... And, and I have to say, do you think people of color are more targeted in this particular respect than the general population? Mm. Well, historically, we have been. Mm -hmm. we, what we, about now in terms of e-cigarettes? Oh, I definitely, I, and I'm sure you guys can speak, speak to that. We're def, we, see, we see it. I mean, we see in communities where there's the neighborhood store, um, where there's a diverse community, the e-cigarettes are there. They're probably, um, you know, in the front of the store for sales. Um, so it's they're not behind the counter locked up like cigarettes. No. Well, I'm, I'm so glad that Lisa brings that up because then we have to look at the saturation of um, community-based markets uh, within mm -hmm. poor black yes. communities. So because of that saturation, there's a higher um, exposure to advertisements, and that encourages smoking more than in mm -hmm. other communities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Other comments. I was uh, thinking about the was, uh, an interesting disparity that has come about um, in regards to young people using uh, the devices that they purchase. Um, and I've seen some of these devices, um, you know, that there's now a pressure to have a, a fancier device. Like hmm. these things range in price, you know, they can get two or three hundred dollars, so I've heard. Wow. And so now you have, oh, you have, you know, you have that $300 device. So, so you mean you know. there is an that industry is that's yes. been built up. You mm -hmm. had talked about yeah. paraphernalia. Mm -hmm. Right. And it's just not the cigarettes. It's like, oh, okay, all of these other adjacent products that mm -hmm. uh, people can make money out of. And there's mm -hmm. been some parents that yeah, have come yeah. to their school from wanting that device back. <laughs> because they, the that's an investment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The parent wanting the device back? Yes. They did, it to to the fam did it belong to when the parent? When they confiscated. When they do, yeah, they can, I don't know who purchased it, but, the, you know, the parents, that's a lot of money. I would like, I and don't know. And how did the, the student get the money in the first place? Right. We don't know. Well, some of the, the, the ways that they get them is to order them via Amazon or some other that's online um, service, and they deliver them without question. So there are mm. uh, policies being entertained about prohibiting that without a signature or an ID at the door mm -hmm. at the time of delivery. Well, I'm just thinking of the money. If it's 200 to $300, then you're a student. I think that there is this parallel between uh, poor communities and affluent mm -hmm. communities and who has them. So the cost of entry, whether it be $40 at the low end or 300 on the high, uh, within that um, variety, there are levels of identity and image consciousness mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. affluence versus um, lack thereof. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. So in the remaining time that we have, I'd like to know more about what can be done and what can we anticipate in this area going forward. I want to say that what, what I find encouraging uh, about young people um, many young people, it's, it's always been young people at the, the forefront of movements, right, mm -hmm. throughout history. And so um, students like Anaya and others that I've worked with, they encourage me. And I, I am so pleased that a social justice issue, something to, to you know, stand on, they want to do that. Um, and so I feel like, you know, if we lock down and some of the, those young people that are willing to, to, to stand up and speak, 
we'll make a new trend. You know, we'll start to shift that culture um, and to anti, you know, anti vaping. And so um, I'm encouraged. I want to say that, yeah, young people are standing up and they're leading the way. It, it, it occurs to me, and you just reminded me, if you're going to change a habit, some say you have to replace it with, with something else. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking this is a good time for replacing. Is there anything that can be given in place of that would be as attractive, as interesting, adopted as part of a new culture? Well, I can't speak to the young folks, but again, what I'm seeing is the replacement is developing those leadership skills to make yourself marketable, to be able to public speak. I, mean, I think those are the things, and to make it look, be cool. I mean, to be cool to hey, you know, be with the mayor and mm -hmm. you know, you know that kind of thing. So it's you're right. I think you have to replace it with now, something. Now, would those be opportunities for every student? I don't see why not. And I think all of us can create those opportunities. Whether it's you know speaking in front of whoever, it might be a TED talk, it might be speaking at your school, it might be speaking at your church, um, you know it could be a variety of different things. This is stuff you can put on your application to get when you you know applying for colleges. Mm -hmm. I mean I think when people start seeing that you know hey if they have put this down, and I know there's also the kind of biological, clinical, medical, and I think that's an area that we need to do more work in. Um, it, instead of the, you know, the punitive, you know, suspension and, and all that, there's, I think there's those folks that are addicted. We need to be helping them mm -hmm. uh, from, a, from a different perspective. But I think if we start, you know, for lack of a word, marketing, that, you know, you can be cool and, and let people see that, like Ayana and other folks, other students, hey, you know, she's college bound, she's done this, she's done this, she's going places. You know, she's going to have some paper in her pocket. Right. You know, she can oh. buy those Jordans or whatever. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. You know, that oh. whole social status thing. Right. People say you can have all those things without, you know, well, vaping. Well, there is a lot that needs to be done, and we will see how much can be done. And uh, we will see if there can be other skills <laughs> <laughs> given in place of, what we currently have now it, that's described as youth culture. Mm -hmm. right. And so I'd like to thank you all, the four of you and the two of you, Shawnice and Anaya, for being here. Um, I have 30 seconds left. Who'd like to have the last word? <laughs> in 30 seconds. <laughs> uh, if you are a youth and you're interested in uh, tobacco prevention, uh, reach out to the Bay Area um, Community Health Advisory uh, Council or the San Mateo Tobacco Prevention Program or just write to your elected official. Thank you. The 30 seconds are over and I'd like to uh, thank you again for being with me and I'd like to thank our audience for watching. Until next time.